Thank you. I'm in pools and spas. I don't float. I don't swim that much because I know what's in the water. <laughs> I have no commercial ties to this business at all. I'm here to talk on science. So I have no reason to distort anything and speak strictly upon the science. But Simultaneously, I'm going to do two things during this talk. One that I always do and one thing that I never do. And the one thing that I always do, like Ashcon points out, I always talk about really gross, disgusting, nasty diseases. Some of them smell so bad they'll make a vulture puke. But, so I always do that. But if you will look at your watch, I'm doing it just before lunch. Blame Ashcon because he thought it would be funny to get me to talk about diarrhea just before lunch. And the other thing that I never do, I'm in all black. I never wear all black. Because today, under the right conditions, I am the voice of doom and gloom that you don't want to hear. I am the disease that you don't want in your float tank. And if we don't do something about it, I am the voice that will kill the entire industry, and that is not an exaggeration. But I'm really an optimistic kind of guy, so that may not happen if we work together. But if we don't work together, it will happen, and that is a promise. But it probably won't, because we are going to be able to work together. All right, now, I don't know much about floating, but what I hear here is one of the most upbeat dynamic groups I have ever been to. And the psychological material, because I've got a lot of experience on depression and I've been around a lot of people with it, and I've encountered it. Wow, we're talking about really positive things that are going on with the human mind. Wrong, I'm a microbiologist. I'm gonna take you through the mind of a germ. So quit thinking like a human, buckle up, because here we go, into the world of a demented microbiologist. <laughs> First off, germs are everywhere. And if you're a germaphobe, there's the exit. Get the hell out, because that's what I'm talking about. And one theory says that there are more germs in you and on you than you have cells in your human body. Now, we don't know whether that's true exactly, but it's a damn good story to open up a talk like this with. And that... Sterile environments really don't happen in, in the natural world. And that our own health depends upon the types and quantities of germs in our bodies. But that when we do really bizarre things like create artificial environments where the vi environment, the germs, and the human body interact, we change that interaction. And that's what we're talking about is the change of the interaction between the germ and the human body. And a 30% solution of magnesium sulfate is a pretty bizarre environment. So let's look at how the interaction between that occurs. Let's look at the world of the germ. Let's look at the human behavior model. Let's look at the environment. Let's look at human physiology. And it is where those areas interact that we are dealing with. It is the interaction between the environment, the germ, the human behavior, and all of these are important. But germs don't have a lot of social anxiety. You call up a germ and say, hey, party. They're there. <laughs> human behavior is a little bit more erratic than we would like. Particularly, you know that if you've got a teenager. We cannot pre-screen our customers. We can't have them walk in and say, hey, take this test strip, put it in your mouth, and if it turns blue, you can't come into my facility because you're at a high-risk individual. We don't do that. Where we can manipulate is the environment. And we can do that by filtration. We can do that by disinfection. We can consider the pH, the alkalinity, all those little things that I work on every day in swimming pools and spas. 
But let's look at the world of germs. This is the world of all the germs. But we don't need to worry about all the germs. We only need to worry about those germs that cause disease. But not all germs, just the germs that cause human disease. But we only need to worry about those human disease germs that are stable in water. But no, we only need to worry about those that are serious diseases because some of them really don't and they don't really create a threat. So it's a very small environment we need to deal with. And if I could, I would have made that little red dot even smaller. But the other speakers have got better AV systems than I got. I got this cheap corporate system. It's, damn it, they're making me look bad. <sighs> okay, what we're talking about is risk. Risk is the chance of something happening. It could be good, it could be bad. And what we're talking about is if somebody gets sick in our float tank, that's bad. But there's a way we can analyze this stuff and we can go through a systematic approach. We call it risk analysis. And we figure out what the risk is and we put a management structure in place and we call it risk management. And we do it every day and you're all doing it and you're not aware of it. But let's look at three ways risk could occur. What are three risky things that you could do today? You could do something really crazy, like get in a car. You could take a shower. You could do one of the most riskiest things in your entire life and eat alfalfa sprouts. So how do we manage these? Well, if we get in a car, you get in a car, you put a seat belt on, you have a car with crumple zones that absorbs energy, you have airbags, you have engineering controls, and in the float system, we have filtration. Wow, it's an engineering control. You've already got risk management designed and you didn't even know it. Now that you know that the riskiest food sold in North America is alfalfa sprouts, you could decide at lunch, I'm not going to eat those. You could send them back. You could not order them. But if you really want to eat them and you want to reduce your risk, fry them. <laughs> the E. coli will be dead. Risk management. But we're in business. And there's another way to do it. We could transfer that risk to somebody else because we could use insurance. We could pay somebody to say, take the risk away from me. Or we could have an consent, consent form that says, it might be hazardous to get into my float tank, so sign this form and don't sue me if it happens. We've transferred the risk. But in other cases, we could say, well, the risk is small and I'm just gonna do it anyway. And one of the things that you probably did this morning is take a shower. Now there's this little bacteria called Legionella pneumophila and it grows in hot water systems, particularly in hotels. And then when you took a shower, it gets flushed out and now it's in the little droplets and you're in a shower, you probably have to breathe every once in a while. So now you've inhaled these little mist droplets and they go right into your lung and that's where Legionella likes to live and now you've got Legionellosis. So here's your choice. You have a very low chance of getting legionellosis in a shower, and you, you'll feel clean and everything, so it'll be fine. Or you were out late last night, and you're going to smell like a dead raccoon. <laughs> Which do you want to do? Low chance, smell like a dead raccoon. That is called a management decision. <laughs> All right, let's talk about risk assessment. Risk is a mathematical equation between something bad, a hazard, and exposure. And this is a mathematical equation, and if you've done math with your kid in elementary school and uh, middle school recently, you will know that if either one of these goes to zero, risk goes to zero. So we can control the type of hazard, and these are called germs, or we can control the type of exposure in here, and we can do this and come up with our risk management system. So how would we do this? Well, that's the way chemists do it. And I'm not a chemist, I'm a microbiologist and that's way too simplified for me. So what we're gonna say is the host must be susceptible to the germ. Now, a week ago today, I was on a business trip out in the Midwest and I went through my hometown where I grew up, a little town in Southeast Kansas and I drove down the street and all the big trees that were there when I was a kid all died. Every one of them's dead, maybe 90% of them dead. They died from a disease called Dutch elm disease. All the trees died, 98% of them. 
didn't kill a single human. Guess what? Humans don't catch tree diseases. So the germ, the host must be susceptible to the germ. Barrier number one. The route of exposure must be appropriate. Okay, let's get back to that diarrhea topic because it's almost lunchtime. <laughs> this, you think, is a cup of coffee. Well, okay, just for the sake of purpose, we're going to say this is a cup of E. coli 0157H7, the nastiest, meanest, dirtiest one you're ever going to see on your life. We're going to say there's eight ounces in here. We're going to say there's an average count in here of about 10 million per milliliter. And that'll give us about 24 billion E. coli 0157H7s. Anybody in a CPO class? Here comes the math. <laughs> Watch. On my arm, approximately 30 to 40 million the infective dose to cause disease is 10. CPO students, which is a bigger number? 30 million, 10. <laughs> Test question, will I get sick? No. Now I'll do the exact same thing with my nice cup of E. coli 0157H7. Uh, what do you think now? Uh, well, about three hours from now, it's going to start with a little bit of pain down here, and then it's going to go into chills and aches and fever, followed by, here it comes, Ashcon, diarrhea. <laughs> soon to be followed by bloody diarrhea, soon to be followed by kidney failure, soon to be followed by death. What's the difference? It was the exact same number of bacteria. The exact same number. There's no difference. One's on the skin, one's in the gut. It all depends on where the germ ends. E. coli is a gut pathogen, not a skin pathogen. The chemists didn't think about that when they did the risk equation. <clears throat> yeah, you can see why chemists love me going to their meetings. <laughs> the amount of the germ makes a difference. Oh, wait a minute. I have another cup of coffee back here. Well, it's the same one, but we're going to pretend it's a different one. Now, I have three E. coli. Three. Three. Not three million. Three. Now I drink the entire cup of coffee. Will I get sick? Three. What is the infective dose? 10. CPO students, which number's bigger, 10 or three? <laughs> Damn, it's getting easy on Monday already, isn't it? I won't get sick. I didn't reach the infective dose. All right. If any one factor is insufficient, you're not gonna get sick. Okay, how do we make this applicable? You gotta have the minimum amount of dose. You might have noticed that not everybody in this room is exactly the same. Some of us have the ability to collect more photons than others. <laughs> <laughs> Further, our immune systems vary. Our response to disease vary. And if I were in E. coli last night and I would have stayed out late till midnight like Jocelyn wanted me to, I may not be feeling as good today because I drank all that adult beverage. No, some of us wanted to be able to talk today, so we went to bed at nine o'clock, so I'm on today. How you feeling, Jocelyn? <laughs> but all these factors come in. Is the host feeling good? Is the germ feeling good? And how does this in play to the health of our patrons? Well, I want to introduce you to a guy who I think could be the hero of the entire float system. Hey, I skipped this slide. We'll get to that one in a minute. But let's talk about... How did these germs get into the body? And then we'll introduce our hero just in a minute. They're going to get in three ways. Ask on, try to make it too complicated. It's not. You're going to inhale them. You're going to swallow them. Or you're going to get something really crazy like get wet. 99% of all the diseases in swimming pools and spas right there. That's it. Done. That's it. That's all we're going to do. That's it. 99%. So let's talk about this. Now we've got a more complicated equation. We're talking about the quantity of germs. We know the exposure pattern. We know 
a lot more. We're beginning to get to the point where we can do a true risk assessment. But we need data. We need to understand what germs we're dealing with. So how do we get data? Well, we go to the Centers for Disease Control and we look at their data. But they have to get their data somewhere. So how did they get data? Well, it starts off by somebody getting sick, and then they have to recognize they're sick, and then they have to figure out how they got sick, and then they have to figure out where they're exposed, and they have to pick up a phone call and, and report it, and then the local agency has to have enough data to decide to do something about it, and then they have to investigate it, and then they have to issue a report, and then it has to go to the state, and then the state sends it to the CDC, and sooner or later, they issue a surveillance summary in one of my favorite publications ever. It's called Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. And if you want to have a germaphobe that you work with, what you do is you print out a copy of it and you lay it on your desk. It'll gross the hell out of people. Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report. And I've had two bosses that are germaphobe, and they leave me the hell alone. All right, so now we've got all this data. And that's three to four years to get all that data. But we've got 20 years of it we can look back on and we can use that. And so now we can take that data and we can assay that and we can say there's two kinds of water that we can talk about. We can talk about swimming pools and spas or we can talk about fresh water. And there's reports from the CDC on these two topics and we compare these and we come down to the bottom of it. And when we look at it, lo and behold, float tanks are more similar to swimming pools and spas than they are natural water. And Ashcon and Graham go off to all these conferences and they run into this crazy idiot who's wearing black up here and trying to make a total ass of himself that happens to be an expert on recreational water illness and that's why I'm here. And for the beer. <laughs> so now we take that data and we apply it. Here's the same guy. Here's the germs. That's it. That's the entire list. Legionella, E. coli, Shigella, norovirus, Giardia, Cryptosporidium, and Pseudomonas, 99% of all the germs, and now we're done. Oh, hell, you saw that coming. No, we're not. <laughs> we can get better than that because we can define it by exposure, and that's what the CDC is just beginning to do because I've been yelling at them for 10 years to do it. So now we look at swimming pools and spas. And lo and behold, swimming pools don't have Legionella. But it grows in swimming pools. It's in there, but why don't they have? Because you don't have droplets, and the droplets don't get inhaled, and the bacteria don't get into the lungs, and you don't get disease. Wow. So don't take a shower, get in the swimming pool, right? <laughs> Except that in the swimming pool, there's all these gastrointestinal germs in there, and people get sick from swallowing water. But they don't swallow water in a spa. Matter of fact, in 20 years, I can't find a single outbreak of gastrointestinal illnesses in spas. What's the difference? Human behavior. Oh, I got back to that early slide after all, didn't I? You wondered how that was coming in. Okay, so the human behavior is different. But pseudomonas, people are wet. Bacteria's there, you're wet. Bacteria's there. Bacteria's having a party because it's living inside of your skin. Let's do the comparison. We go through the comparison of the water quality and the parameters and everything, and something jumps out. I'm a physiologist. Holy cow, have you people got some salt in the water? <laughs> this is where that hero comes in. You might have heard of this guy. I think this is the guy that he is the savior of the entire industry. And if you think this story is fishy, you would be right. <laughs> because this guy lived in a little place called Mount Vernon on the Chesapeake and Potomac Rivers, just south, 11 miles south of present-day Alexandria, Virginia. That's where he lived. And in the spring, there would be huge runs of shad that ran up the river. Huge runs. Now, people in England, and we were English at the time, George was English, he was a good businessman. He figured, hey, wait a minute, let's catch all these fish. And let's ship them to England. So George took his crew out, they were slaves, caught all the fish. Now, 
Just north of Alexandria is a place called Arlington, and that's where Ronald Reagan National Airport is. So George went out, caught all the fish, drove them by truck up to uh, Ronald Reagan National Airport, put them on a 747 and flew them to London, made a fortune from the British, then led a revolution against the British and was still rich afterwards. <laughs> and the British continued to buy fish. But wait a minute, he did it before there were 747s, before there was Ronald Reagan National Airport, before there were motor vehicles and before there were refrigeration. He shipped hundreds of barrels of fish. And this was before Benjamin Franklin figured out where the Gulf Stream was. So it took 60 days in some cases to get barrels of fish from Alexandria to London. George made a fortune. If the fish smelled like you can imagine they would have smelled, George wouldn't have made a fortune. But he did something brilliant. He used a magic chemical. Salt. Wow. Now, I'm a physiologist. Float tanks. Instantly, salt. We all need salt. We all need a specific kind of salt. We need the concentration of salt. And if we have more salt, we have less water. And our cells need a balance between salt and water. And as we have more salt, we have less water, and we have a way of measuring that, and we call it available water or water activity. And it's A sub W, sometimes it's capital A, sometimes it's small a, I don't care. All right, but we can measure it. A, Ashcon, remember? Took you forever to find it? Guess how long it took me to make this slide for this presentation, Ashcon? 90 seconds. <laughs> it's publicly available information. It's this high technology called Google. All right, so here's AW, and we can measure it. Distilled water, zero, 1.00. Pseudomonas cannot grow if the AW is less than 0 0.97. E. coli, 0.1579H7, uh, 0.95. Candida, you can go right down, let's get down to the 20% sodium chloride. That's less salt than you're using in it, sodium chloride. The AW is 0.83. Everything above it will not grow, will not survive. Whoa. As we add, I can't find mag sulfate, probably because we don't use it as a food preservative, but we're way down in here. Way down in here. I think we're doing pretty good. This is a pretty antimicrobial environment. It's impressive to a physiologist. It's not impressive to departments of health because they haven't had all the classes that I did in food science. <laughs> and some of those classes out in food science at Arkansas, you got the taste panel, they gave you free food. Grad student, free food. <laughs> okay, here is a risk assessment. Legionella can't multiply. Pseudomonas cannot multiply. E. coli, Shigella, die off over several hours. They will decline. Viruses, maybe. Giardia and Cryptosporidium are very environmentally hardy. So we've already eliminated about half of the major bugs just by talking about salt. They're not an issue. But could you still get sick. Well, let's take a theoretical case where somebody had a case of cryptosporidium or giardia about 10 days ago. They're feeling better, they don't have diarrhea right now, but you know the commercial, it's one of the toilet paper commercials where the bears are walking around and there's the little bear family. They walk into the cabin and go, I can't stay here, they got the wrong kind of toilet paper in here. What are they talking about? They're talking about that all of us carry a few grams of feces on our backsides. And we know from statistical studies done down in Arizona by Charles Gerbesting, and they were grad students, of course, naturally, they had to do this kind of work. We know that the average person carries 0.14 grams of feces on their backside. So let's take this person that was sick about 10 days ago and they still have some of these germs in the GI tract because we're in the healing process and we're gonna put them in a float tank. They didn't take a shower first, they didn't follow instructions. They washed these off. 
And we're going to make a theoretical assumption that we don't run the filter, because this is the kind of thing the health department's going to ask. And they're going to say, what happens if the next person gets into the float tank and swallows water? What is the statistical likelihood of them getting one of these diseases? And we can do this. We can take three scenarios. They had a little bit, they had a moderate amount, or we can do a worst case. So let's take a small amount. They washed off 100,000 oocysts. We can calculate how many are in each mill of water, and we can calculate how many ounces of water that individual has to swallow to become ill. So in this top scenario, this person must swallow 22 and a half ounces of float water. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so they get a little more washed off of them on person A. The next person has to swallow, and this is an average amount, perhaps just theoretical calculation. They have to swallow two and a quarter ounces. That's about a quarter of my cup of E. coli up in here. What's the chance that somebody's actually going to swallow two and a quarter ounces of mag sulfate water? <laughs> is it zero? Will a health department ask you, is it zero? It's not zero, but it's very slight. But instead of being sick 10 days ago, what about our person A was sick yesterday with diarrhea? And so they've got a lot more. So now they've washed off 10 million. Oh, oh, sis. And they're salt tolerant. And so the next person gets in there, and they only have to swallow a quarter of an ounce. They could get sick. Wow. But don't we have something called a filter? What happens if we have a one micron bag filter? And we run various cycles between users. Do we have the same thing? Well, we can do that too. And this top group, we only ran about two cycles on a one micron bag filter. Only two cycles. And look, in the worst case scenario, you've washed 10 million crypto in there. That person has to swallow two and a quarter ounces to get sick. Wow, that's about two, three cycles. That's it. But if you run it like five cycles, now that person has to swallow a pint and a half. Whoa! But, you know, I really like the fact that up there, this top one up here, 225 ounces? 225 ounces. They've got to swallow a gallon and a half of water. We can do the mathematical calculation so we can do the risk assessment. We can figure out what's going on. And at the World Aquatic Health Conference, three uh, gentlemen will be presenting this type of much more detailed analysis to a small little group referred to as the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Because Michael will be sitting in the front aisle. I'll make sure of it, Graham. So we haven't presented it yet, but it's available. So you're seeing the preview of it. But now, Based on all the above, eh, what's going to happen in a float tank? Okay. Theoretically, the demented mind of a microbiologist is going to tell you, Legionella, it's not going to happen. It's not going to grow. It's not going to multiply. It can't become significant. It will never grow fast enough. You don't have aerosolizing devices. Legionella is not an issue. By the way, Legionella is the only one that is universally fatal. 
about 40% of the cases of Legionella in spas are fatal. So the number one high fatality organism is not a threat. Period. End of debate. Not arguable by any health department. Pseudomonas, it can't multiply. It will not reach levels significant. This is the one they're always going to ask about. No. Then they're going to say, well, what about Staphylococcus aureus? Well, I'm going to say, well, you find me one case of Staphylococcus aureus, one, just one, that has ever been documented to be transmitted in water in pools and spas, just one. It doesn't happen. It might survive, but it's not transmitted in water. It's transmitted on the furniture in your front offices, in your changing rooms. Oh crap, we haven't got there yet. <laughs> Dermal diseases are not an issue in float tanks. End of debate. E. coli shigella, pretty close to zero. Crypto and Giardia, close but not quite zero. But if that user gets into that float and has diarrhea, all bets are off. You will drain the tank. You will disinfect it, and you will start from scratch. And if they tell you you don't have to, somebody doesn't know their science. The science is clear. There is no other way to eliminate the risk in the kind of systems that we've got drain the water and start from scratch. Are there other things that we should consider? Maybe. Now we'll get to those in a minute. But that's all theoretical. And I think it was Grand Rapids at National Environmental Health Association. We're sitting there at lunch with Graham and Ashcon, and, and these guys looked across the table at me, and we've gone, hey, yeah, we've been doing microbiology. You've been doing what? <laughs> you know, and it's like, they've been collecting microbiology. Crap, I didn't. It's not published. Okay. So... Ashcon sent me the data. It's not perfect. It's not the way I would have done it because I'm a micro geek. And they were doing it at a contract lab and the contract lab was doing standard things. And unless you tell a contract lab exactly what you to do, they're going to pull a standard method out and they're going to say, hey, we can do it this way and we can charge her $35 a plate and we can make a fortune at it. And it's not necessarily the data that you want, but they can make a fortune on it, but we can still get some data out of it. Here it is. Graham, has this ever been seen in public before? Okay, you're seeing it. All right, CPO students, take this data down because there's a test on it tomorrow. <laughs> Damn, there's not. But let's put a summary on it. Heterotrophic plate count, general bacteria, zero. Pseudomonas, zero. Coliform, zero. E. coli, zero. Staphylococcus or zero. Wow, wait a minute. A theoretical model coincides with an actual world data. <laughs> Fellow scientists, top that one. <laughs> I hadn't seen the data before I wrote the slides. I got one right. Okay. Put the two together, theoretical, real world. Respiratory will not happen. Dermal, with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, will not happen. Gastrointestinal illness, user behavior very similar to spas, and in 20 years of looking at this data, I have never, not once, ever found a documented case of a gastrointestinal illness from a spa. We have the same user pattern. 
and we have something called better filtration when we're using a bag filter. We've changed the game altogether, and we've got back into the engineering controls. We've got back into the human behavior. We've got back into the physiology, and we've tied all that together. There we go. Feeling a little bit better? Am I still Dr. Doom and Gloom? You damn right I am. <laughs> We're in the tunnel. And there's light. It's one of two things. It's either daylight or a train. <laughs> okay. I have been doing this as of today 27 years and seven days. Take it from me, that is not daylight. <laughs> the name of this train is called Regulations. All right. Now, Graham and Ashcon proposed something yesterday, and I didn't know they were going to do it, and it ties perfectly into what we need to talk about for the next couple of minutes. Because there's two kinds of trains. And what this group does collectively over the next 24 to 48 months determines what kind of train it is. Train number one. It is 110 fully loaded cars of coal coming out of Wyoming, going through my hometown in Kansas. It is going 80 miles an hour, and it will run over the hell, the top of you, and leave you dead like a possum laying on the sun. <laughs> Option A, your choice. Option B, it is Amtrak. It is slowing down and coming up to the station, and it is going to let you on. And it's going to invite you into the club car, and it's going to give you a croissant and a chai tea. <laughs> Do you want to fight the train or work with the train? I'm in pools and spas. This is a decision that we make collectively. You make. I might be able to help a little bit, but you have to make the decision and put the energy in as to which way it's going to go because that train is coming, it's already approaching, and the Conference for the Model Aquatic Health Code is already published stuff, and the CDC has already put it in, and some states are already putting in there, and that is called regulations. Okay, I'm going to finish early because I got fast on a couple of slides. But here's what I want to think today. The first thing I'm going to tell you is you damn well better have an operations manual. It better be detailed. It better have training in there. And when they walk in there, you better know what you're doing in case of an accident. And if you don't have that, work on it tonight instead of going to the bar. Two, if somebody said, yeah, I had diarrhea last week, get them the hell out of your facility and tell them to come back in 14 days. Yep. Period. This is not something subject to discussion. This must be your policy to protect your livelihood and the health and safety of your next patrons. Periodically disinfect all the other surfaces because I'm not worried about the water. I'm actually worried about the other surfaces. I'm worried about the fungi that are going on the walls. I'm worrying about the staff out in the changing areas. Are you disinfecting that with a material that says US EPA registration number blah, 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 blah on the side of it? Because if you're not using a disinfectant on those surfaces, you're fooling yourself. Get a hospital grade disinfectant and put it in there and use it or the health department is gonna eat your lunch because they know about it. And if you don't, you're at risk. Consider using that bag filter with UV. You could use other things, but that combination is already in some of the regulations. You can put peroxide in there. You can put other things in there, but this is the minimum combination you should be using in a float tank. And if there's a fecal incident, you're draining it. Okay, where should we be going in the future? Do not, do not, do not, do not, do not ever say, 
your float tank is germ-free because I'll prove you're wrong. Health department can be your friend or your enemy. Make them your friend. Publish the current data. Yes, Graham, Ashcon, and I are working on it. Collect more data. And where we are weak is we don't know about fungi. We don't know about staff on surfaces. We don't know about viruses. We don't know about GRD. We don't know about crypto. But we can get that information before it's imposed on us. That requires collective work. And darn it, I'm 17 seconds over. And I'll be glad to talk about any diseases over any meal you want to share. <laughs> <laughs>